you, you, know, you, you came from the heart of government. You spent a lot of time now looking at populism from, I suppose, a different, you had a different trajectory to Bannon. But what did you think about what you just heard? I think um, it lays the gauntlet down. I mean, it's a, it's a challenge, massive challenge to, um, to our societies, what he's talking about. In some ways, I felt a bit more, a bit more optimistic um, because I think, I think he's making a um, mistake with this, uh, this, this um, movement. But um, let me which, which mistake precisely? Well, I think, um, I mean, Macron is a populist. Mm. Macron won by being the outsider, forming a new party, um, challenging the system. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn is a, um, a populist. Um, he is um, seeking to challenge the, the elite um, and to demand change. And you know, I think the challenge is that there's got to be change and we can discuss that. But um, those populists aren't joining this movement. I mean, this is a movement um, which is uh, you know, which is parties which aren't simply demanding that ordinary people are listened to, because they do need to be, mm. or that economies must be run to pursue the national interest and good jobs for all, which they should. Um, the parties where the common thread is that they, they want to preserve the Judeo-Christian tradition against... Um, outsiders with a kind of strong racial and religious uh, dimension. Steve is very careful not to use those words in what he says, but in the end, you judge people by the company they keep. And this is not great company. I mean, this is a company which David Cameron mistakenly chose after 2005, when he um, left the European People's Party and realized very quickly this was a very bad uh, idea. I mean, it's not surprising that um, the UKIP um, has dwindled, dwindled in popularity. It's not simply because what's been happening with Brexit, it's also because of the company they've kept. And I think if, um, if Steve wanted to see the rise of populist nationalism, then he should stand back, keep out of the way, and allow it to occur in the individual circumstances of individual countries. I think this movement will be seen for what it is, because I think in our country, um, you know, we could talk about this. There are really, really strong fears and concerns and worries. And he is, Steve is completely right. There's a very strong parallel between Brexit and the rise of Trump. And anybody who thinks defending the status quo or telling people they should be grateful, I mean, that is very foolish. So there is a deep problem to, um, to, uh, to deal with. But this is also a country which um, I think has fought fascism directly and has also um, you know, a, a view about liberty and tolerance, which is quite deep. And I think that's true of many other European countries as well. You, and you... I, think that, and I think that the idea that you form a movement based upon the, the values and beliefs of the particular political parties he's choosing, I think this is really, really dangerous. I mean, when you listen to him, the rise of the millennials, actually the millennials in our country voted massively decisively to stay in the European yes. Union. After the most painful economic and financial crisis um, that we've experienced in our lifetimes, the populations of Ireland and Greece, and let's be honest, Spain, and so far Italy too, have said, whatever the pain, we want to stay part of the European group because we think that is where our, our destiny uh, is. And so the idea that, um, that, 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 that it, it's inevitable that the young or, the, or the, um, the medium voter or southern European countries are going to peel away. I mean, that's not what we've seen uh, so far. And I don't think they're going to do so around a movement which, when you look at its core, its core is, I mean, is anti-Muslim, anti-Semitic, uh, discriminatory. And I don't think Steve likes that, but I think it's true, and I think it will be seen for that. Whereas, actually, if he, if he stood back and allowed a series of Trump-like movements to occur, that would, that would be a much more dangerous thing. So I think the one good thing I thought to, today, listening to him, is thank God he's forming this movement. I mean, that's really going to help. <laughs> do, you think, do you think that there is something more dangerous about Europe, the thing I've pushed him on a bit, 
there is something more dangerous in Europe. We are a place where there has been bloodshed recently, where the, the, he is, people like Orban are, are reawakening yeah. unpleasant things. I think, I mean, look, I, I read a really interesting piece by uh, um, Branko Milanovic um, today, who was talking about um, um, this movement, but also understanding the revolutions of um, 20, um, of 30 years ago. And, you know, the reality was that in those countries, they weren't, they weren't um, revolutions which were about the embrace of democracy or liberalism. They were, they they were, they were movements which were about taking back control of their country from outside uh, aggressors. And um, so, so it's not surprising that, uh, that, um, that you have people who can get traction with some of those views. But actually, uh, the European Union, if, if, if well managed, and I don't think it's been brilliantly managed at all, is a way to bring those countries into a bigger internationalist fold. And you know, the, the, so the, the thing which, which, which worries me is that um, you know, in the last 50 years, we've made massive progress in reducing world poverty and delivering peace through countries cooperating uh, together. And we need that cooperation into the future. And a, um, a nationalist, my country against the world, is, 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 going to, is going to make things harder and opens up some of those old divides. So I'm worried about it, and I'm worried about um, the vulnerability of populations if we don't address the deep the problems we have, which we can talk about. But um, yeah, you talk, you've talked about immig was it immigration, the wage squeeze, and then the one, particularly one I wanted to push you on, the financial crisis, and, and the, those things coming together. In a way, Bannon blame the people in this room, rightly or wrongly. Yeah, I mean, do, you, do you agree with that? Well, look, I mean, I was um, Treasury Minister and then a Cabinet Minister, and we, we were all uh, culpable. I mean, let, let, let's not forget that the most profound piece of international cooperation then solved the world, saved the world from depression. From depression, and today, I think the world faced with another crisis like that would be in a much more vulnerable place because. The, the, there's no the, money left. Well, one, there's no money left, but also the leaders who believe in cooperation aren't there in the, yes. the same way. And, you know, historically, it's tended to be America and Britain who have catalyzed that kind of cooperation, and both of our countries are less able to do that at the, um, at the moment. But, you know, the, the thing Steve Bannon said, which was right, which you can't um, underestimate, is how much disdain there is for the people who are in charge and the established order. The, um, in the TV programme I made, we spent three months travelling all through the South meeting Trump voters. And I think lots of people who watch the programme are kind of assuming you're going to find people who are either, um, uh, they're either extreme mm. and, and racist and, and, and nasty, or people who've deluded and been fooled. And actually what you find again and again is people who just want change. And lots of people who voted for Obama in 2008 and then Trump in 2016 because Obama was a change guy and didn't deliver as they see it. People, the police officer we meet down in Louisiana who says, all my life, I'm not, he was a really good guy and very aware, very thoughtful, but he says, all my life, I've had Democrats who broke their promises as president and then Republicans who broke their promises as president. And then this guy comes along and the Democrats and the Republicans both think he's a bad guy. And I think, well, in that case, give him a chance, roll the dice. And that sort of sense that um, people want to um, change, and it's partly about the financial crisis and the fact that it wasn't expected and it wasn't, we didn't see it coming, and that ordinary people paid a big price for that, and that they don't think there has been sufficient change. It's partly, though, which precedes the financial crisis, that in America and Britain, the median earner, not the poor, the median earner, has not really seen their living standards rise for, for a long time. 15, 20, 25 years. And then I think the third thing, which is also something, and you, you know, um, the, the centre ground has to take these things on board if we're not going to um, lose this battle to um, the, the, the extremes and the kind of talk you heard from Steve. The third thing is absolutely immigration. When I was um, um, a child, global capital markets were liberalising after um, the end of... Um, free floating exchange rates and the abol abolition of exchange controls. And when I was a young Harvard student and then came into politics, we thought the next phase of globalization was about, was about trade. We thought that what was happening was that companies 
would locate in other parts of the world because they could trade. Yeah. And therefore, our challenge was going to be um, companies moving away from America or Britain to Spain or Portugal or Poland or India and China. The thing which we didn't see was globalization was also going to become about um, the movement probably. of people for economic reasons. The reason we didn't have transitional controls in 2004 on East, East European migration was not that we were relaxed about it, we just didn't think anybody was going to come. It was on nobody's radar that you would have a big economic movement of people looking for work. I mean, our view was it was really sticky, that it would be, it would be under 10,000 a year rather than 250,000 plus. And I think that that, um, you know, I've felt for a very long time that, that free movement was um, not sustainable in the European Union, that unless we reform free movement, Britain was going to leave. And I think we are leaving because of free movement. I think take back control was about migration. The parallel is clear to um, Donald Trump in the building of his, um, of his wall. So unless you find a way to manage globalization and manage migration in a way which people think is fair and, 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 um, and something they can deal with, then, um, you, then, you... then they're not going to listen. What you've got to do is stop that being then taken over by people who have a very different and a very more, a very, a more sinister agenda. And I think, I think you know, if Donald Trump and Steve Bannon are not, as they say, racist, then they are playing with fire to a terrible extent. Because what they end up doing is dividing communities and countries on racial grounds. That, that's the effect. I mean, people end up feeling very vulnerable in the place which they thought was their home and where their citizenship lies because of the color of their skin. That is a nasty thing. And it's a dangerous thing. I sat in the TV program in Mar-a-Lago hearing um, a speech by um, Judge Janine, a Fox News presenter at the one year on Donald Trump party. And I've never felt so uncomfortable hearing a political speech in my life because it's, it, it's, it's so dangerous. I think what he's doing is really dangerous. But one, there's an opportunity to expose it now because there's a movement, but the quid pro quo is that mainstream politics has got to be about change, not about the status quo. One, one huge change which is coming towards us is Brexit. Do you, what, what would you reckon for soft Brexit? Do you reckon that's an 80% chance? What, where, where do you put that? Well, first of all, to pick up Steve's point, the people who voted for Donald Trump live outside the cities. They tend to be more affluent if they live in the mm. suburbs. They tend to be older. Um, they are less likely to have a university education. Uh, those are exactly the same demographics as people who voted for Brexit. And in the end, the Brexit vote was a vote for change. And the catastrophe of, um, in the end, the Cameron government was he said to people in 2015, I'm going to change things, failed to get the reforms, had a referendum anyway, basically on the message which was stick with the status quo. And lots of people thought, well, you know, if that's the status quo, lots of people, Labour voters on lower incomes, Conservative voters on high incomes outside of the, the cities, yeah. thought, well, if that is the status quo, I'll roll, I'll roll the dice but, for change. But now, if there was another vote, if another vote now, do you think Remain would win? Well, I think, um, I think, I think the polls have, are very close and haven't moved. Mm. I think, um, I mean, I think, a referendum is a really bad way to make these decisions. And once you've done it, it's not clear that another referendum feels necessarily the best way to, to reconsider it. I mean, I kind of think that your politics needs to be able to sort that out. Is there, I mean, any, is there any way of... of... To, to answer your question, I think it is quite conceivable, likely, that, remain, that Leave would win a second referendum uh, in these circumstances, especially if on the table is... Um, a change in, in migration rules away from free movement. All you would need is the government to say that we will deliver a version of what was announced for the Migration yeah. Advisory Committee a week ago, and I think that would be, be enough to, um, to do it. I voted Remain. I don't think we should leave the European Union, but, I'm a, but at the moment, the argument has not been won at all um, that this is a bad idea. I think people who voted Remain feel even more strongly it's a bad idea. And people who really want to leave are even more convinced they want to leave. And most people in the middle, the most important thing they probably think is we were told it was going to be really bad 
and so far it's not been too bad. And so do you, but do you expect there to be a soft Brexit of some sort? Well, I, um, I think that there is a, a majority in Parliament to leave the European Union. Um, I am not sure at the moment there is a majority in Parliament for any particular way to leave the European Union, for any, for any uh, deal. Um, but the hard Brexiteers, so far, for all their huff and puff, have been willing to come into line because they know that, um, that, that, that leaving on that timetable for them is the most important thing. Um, so on that basis, uh, it may be that Theresa May gets a version of the Chequers deal. That kind of depends upon and whether our, our European can partners you, can are willing to... Can you comment on Theresa May? It struck me, you, you look at your career, you had... You lived in the middle of the soap opera that was Brown Blair. You had, you mentioned Cameron, you had Cameron Osborne going on for a long time. Theresa May, there is no one somebody pairs her with um, for the point of view of sitting in the middle of a government in the middle of a crisis like this. Do you have any reflections on that? Well, I think, I think she's, I think actually she's been very brave. Um, I actually think that in the Blair and Brown years, for all the fact that there were tensions, and there were, I mean, we all know that, um, together they achieved some really good things, partly because of the challenge of that relationship. And constitutionally, in our system, you need that challenge and tension. I mean, we didn't join the Euro. That was one of the best decisions we ever made, in my view. And that happened because of the challenge in that relationship. I think part of the problem in the Cameron Osborne years in retrospect, was that there was insufficient challenge. And we now know, I mean, George Osborne didn't want to leave the European Union, but he was also, didn't think the referendum was a great idea. But in the end, that was a conversation he had in private. But um, I, think, I think he probably regrets that. So actually, a bit more grit in that relationship would have been a, uh, a good thing. I think Theresa May um, doesn't like challenge. I mean, she's got challenge all... all um, around her. I'm not totally sure whether um, her, her original cabinet was quite as wise as, as people said um, that, it, that it was, um, but, but she's got challenge. I think my frustration with Theresa May is that um, I wish she was just, I mean, it's really hard in British politics at the moment because both main parties are so divided on the fundamental mm. issue and that you can't, in our system, it's not a presidential system where you have your own mandate and you can't run against the Congress or run against um, uh, the, um, the Senate in the way that you can in America. Donald Trump has been the president for two years and he still acts like the leader of the opposition. Do you think there's room for a third party? Well, hello, well let, me, let me just answer, sorry, answer your question. So it, uh, it's really hard for Theresa May to hold a party together, which she has to do in order to be able to govern. Mm. But I personally think that she would be better at this stage levelling a bit. I think her problem is... She, she keeps wanting to tell each part of her party that she can deliver for them, and she can't. Mm. She can't make the Remainers and the hard Brexiteers happy and do a deal with the European Union. And I think that she, at some point she's going to have to say, if we leave in a sensible way, this is as good as it's going to get and kind of, kind of come, come out fighting. I think she's been too slow to... Uh, do you think she might be in a situation that? where she brings something to Parliament, it loses once and she gets it... To get something else through on the second I, I think, time. I think the, the fundamental question you have to ask in a parliamentary system is do the people with the majority want a general election? You can have a general election in our system any time mm. if the majority party wants it. You tell me any Conservative MP at the moment who thinks a general election is a good idea. Uh, they're, they're none. Do you think the DUP thinks a general election is a good idea at the moment? They are in the pound seat at the moment. And the last thing they want is um, this Labour Party to be in number 10. Nobody wants a general election. So therefore, in the end, um, in the end, they will, they will have to find they will hang a on. deal to support. Now, actually, my personal view, what the most likely thing is, this is kind of cynicism about European politics, I think that it's going to be, it's going to be very hard to find a detailed deal which our parliament and the European side can agree to. I think everybody knows no deal is a catastrophe, and both sides know that. And therefore, the most likely thing is, but, but actually, 
the hard Brexiteers, the Tory majority with the DUP and our European partners will want to respect the, the March deadline. So in the end, it will go quite close to the wire. There'll be some long kind of veal-based dinner uh, or, or whatever. And in the end, we, we will leave probably without doing a deal at all, simply saying the status quo continues until such time as we can negotiate what the new arrangement will be. And we might pay the money, but, um, but you can with the status quo for a period. And if that looks like it's indefinite, then the hard Brexiteers find it hard. But it's going to have to take, it could, could take quite a long time. So we don't leave the customs union immediately because we can't sort out the Irish problem. But we don't say we're going to stay in it indefinitely. We just say we'll stay in it for now. So we fudge it. And you sort of fudge it um, uh, going forward. And, and, and it's kind of a classic European way to... Um, to do things, and, and we just and we just sort of, I think, from a business point of view, it's quite uncertain. But at the same time, it kind of could be a lot worse. The the huge irony when you think about what's happened on that basis um, is that the only thing that's happened after you've left is that because we're, on that basis you have the same customs rules and yeah. single market rules and immigration rules. The only thing which has changed is that that we used to have some influence over them. And so the only thing which has happened is we're actually far from taking back control, we lose control. So it kind of, it's an irony, but of course that can't uh, last unless, um, unless you can change the immigration rules then that falls you, me you mentioned the terror of a Labour government. Which would you prefer, Jeremy Corbyn or being tasered again? The tasering was really, really painful. <laughs> it was over in five seconds. <laughs> so, <laughs> And I will leave people to draw I, that. You know, for, 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 for my art, of course I'd do it again if asked. <laughs> but, you know, look, I am... Um, you, you your question about the third party is really interesting. I think it's, it's possible there'll be some breakaway. I think it is unlikely it can succeed. Because actually, this is a parliamentary democracy. It's not a PR system. Nobody can do a Macron um, in the way in which he did. Because you can never get through a PR... I mean... His huge advantage, even though in the first round he polled the same as, um, as Nigel Farage, who yes. won no seats, he ends up, because the others fall away, ending up fighting de facto a fascist in the final ballot. And so people, you know, that's an unpalatable choice and they vote for Macron. That's not how our system works, which is why UKIP never won in a general election a parliamentary but You look, you look back at the STP, which you, you and I both lived through, obviously very young people at the time. But, you know, the STP for a while was at 50% in the polls. But, but, they, but they, never, they never ever had an electoral breakthrough. And uh, the, the, for a political party... There are always, for, for a, in a parliamentary system, there's always tensions. There's, there's a tension between, you know, a London Tory and a rural Tory, an Islington Labour guy and a mm. South Shields uh, Labour guy. You need to have a galvanising purpose which binds you together, you know, to save the NHS or to... Um, uh, to, to tame trade union power for the Tories in 79, a galvanising purpose which can unite all aspects of your coalition. The difficult thing you've got at the moment for both Labour and Conservatives is Brexit absolutely divides those coalitions. Nice. So the Islington and the South Shields or the George Osborne and the, um, and the William Rees Mogg constituency, they're so different. In those circumstances, the only thing which gives you the glue to succeed politically is history and tradition. You have to talk about a you know, hundred years of our political party, you know, our predecessors, our shared values. We fought tough battles before and we'll do it again. And what the SDP had was an absence of shared history. And, and in the absence of glue, I mean, were they a liberal London-like Roy Jenkins party? Or were they a David Owen working class regions party? I mean, Roy Jenkins stay in the European Union? Yes. David Owen ends up voting for Brexit, and they had no glue. So in the end, they fall apart. And I think the reason why both Labour and Conservative politicians who are frustrated at the direction of things are so cautious is because once you lose your history and your shared values, the, the backstory which binds, then um, it's very hard to unite. And Brexit is so hard to... You know, uh, nobody can win a general election at the moment unless they can get people who voted Remain and Leave to vote for their parties. And, um, and how do you do that with sub without, um, without history? That's a problem we will wait for. I'm going to ask you first to give 
Ed Balls a long round of applause. Well, hopefully. Not. And, and just do some closing remarks is that uh, thank you all for, for joining us for Invest London. Again, thank you to the founding sponsor iShares by BlackRock and to Jane Street for making this event possible. There were lots of things outside. Um, we'll see you all back here tomorrow at 9 a.m. for a half day of interviews and panel discussions, which tomorrow focused a little bit far away from Ed and Steve on, on ETFs. But there is now a cocktail hour uh, next door with free drink. Thank you.